Many of you may not know this, but I do stream over on Twitch at twitch.tv slash biggdgeekdom101, where we do classic video games from the past, as well as some new ones too. Twitch.tv slash biggdgeekdom101. Give me a follow, and we'll have a good time. There are more Crash Bandicoot games coming, so I decided why not do a video game memories here on World of Geekdom about Crash Bandicoot because I do have memories of playing Crash Bandicoot and things that happened back in the day during that era. So, Crash Bandicoot... Now, first of all, I want to say that I've never actually played Crash Bandicoot 3 and I never beat 2, so... I know a lot of you guys are going to say, man, you got to play the third one. It's the best one. I've heard the same thing. I have not played it yet, but I do own it on PS4 in the Crash Collection that came with the with Spyro as well. It's like a double pack. came with the Spyro Collection, the Crash Collection, so I'll get to it eventually. But I want to go back to Crash Bandicoot. And to talk about Crash Bandicoot, you got to talk about what was going on in the mid-90s. So the Sony PlayStation had launched. It's been out for a while. It's getting some momentum. Right, but Nintendo was still seen by most of the fans of video games as the top dog because Nintendo had been the top dog for over a decade at this point. And so, uh, well, around a decade. So, Sony, you know, was fiercely competing. They had a lot of third party support, they had a lot of, you know, great games coming out on the PlayStation. The PS1 is an incredible, incredible system, uh, even to this day. But, Nintendo still had sort of these uh, these iconic characters, like, you know, the, the Nintendo brand characters that would eventually make up the original Smash. You know, Mario, Samus, Link. Um, later on, of course, we got Pikachu. But you also had, you know, Star Fox. You know, these sort of characters that were made by Nintendo, and thus Nintendo themselves first party characters had complete control over them you wouldn't see mario on a playstation system or on a um you know on a sega system and the thing about that is the quality of games also was important because at that time you know mario and zelda were putting out quality games each and every time right each and every time so the sony playstation while i had a great array of games it was kind of lacking those kind of platformers and it was kind of lacking its own mascot so that's when crash bandicoot came around and i remember the crash bandicoot commercials early on uh were awesome because they got this guy and they dressed him up as crash bandicoot and he would go to what i guess was supposedly in real life i mean i, I don't i've never been there but maybe it's accurate nintendo headquarters in redmond washington and he would go there with a megaphone and just start kind of trashing talking trash to um to Nintendo. Now you have to understand that the late 90s was the era of like Tom Green and then Jackass came around. So this kind of in your face, you know, kind of edgy attitude was something that was like a thing during that time. I remember South Park blew up around that time. The attitude era of pro wrestling blew up. And yes, Dragon Ball Z. People liked sort of the edgy, cool stuff. So, you know, um, this guy would just be talking trash, you know, about the plumber and this and that. And the, the thing is, though, if you're going to do something like that, you better make sure your game can back it up. You can talk trash all you want to about Nintendo, and you can hate on them all you want, but they have a history of putting out good games. Point blank, you can't argue that. They put out some stinkers, too, but most of the quality of the game library they put out is usually good. So, and especially with Mario. So, Crash Bandicoot had to be at least a good game. I'm not saying that it had to be better than Mario World or Mario 3 or even Mario Land, but it had to be at least a good platformer that was satisfying. Now, what made Crash Bandicoot different was that instead of it being a side-scrolling platformer where you're moving left to right like Mario games were, it was sort of this um, 3D, kind of like Mario 64, like a 3D platformer, but it wasn't sort of open world like Mario 64. You had a pathway you were going up, so it was kind of like a third-person view from behind Crash Bandicoot as you move up through the level. So it was... In a funny way, like a two, like a 2D platformer, but just from a, from a third-person view, which was really kind of cool. I mean, yes, obviously Mars C4 was similar, but it was cool to kind of have more of a 2.5D kind of game because it kind of provided different challenges. You know, you had you couldn't just run around things all the time. Sometimes you could. You know, you had to make sure that you were in the right area to dodge and move and jump. And I liked that. I really, really enjoyed that. I enjoyed. Um, that aspect of it. Now, with that being said, 
my time playing Crash Bandicoot, um, I did have fun, for sure, but I don't know if Crash Bandicoot was ever really at the level of, like, the great Mario games, you know what I mean? I think it was a great game, I had fun with it, and it was probably the closest that Sony came to competing with Mario as far as platformers go, from their own sort of group, I guess you can say, but I still don't know if it really matched up to Mario, you know, but it was still fun, and that's what was most important. It's been a long time, like over 20 years, but I think the first time I actually played this game was a demo of it that came with, I think, the Sony PlayStation magazines. And those of you who are young are not going to have a clue what I'm talking about, but if you're around my age, maybe a little younger, a little older, you know, you'll remember that the PlayStation had this magazine that would release these demo discs, and the discs would have sometimes four or five demos on them for upcoming games. And I think, I think that's when I first played Crash Bandicoot. I think that, I think that's when it was. As a villain, I really liked Dr. Neo Cortex, but I gotta say that it did come off at first to me like he was a copy of Dr. Robotnik. Not because he was just a doctor, but I felt like Crash Bandicoot, in many ways, based on the promos, the commercials, and the way it was positioned, was supposed to be sort of a parody of Mario and Sonic, because it wasn't just Nintendo they were going after. Sega was still in the hunt at that time, and the Sega Saturn and the Sony PlayStation had a very competitive you know, a couple of years there, even though it was really, in Japan, it was more competitive. In the U.S., Sony was kind of whooping their ass. But I feel like he may have been maybe a little wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you know, uh, for, for, for that, for, you know, Sonic. And because of, like, the jungle setting, the game also reminded me of Donkey Kong Country. Now, I don't know if that was done on purpose or not, but it does kind of feel like an amalgam of different platformers put in together into one. Um, I really like the system of getting the masks how you can put the mask on to protect yourself. That was kind of a cool idea. And I really like sort of how the bonus stages were set up as well, you know, with like the collecting and everything um, and the gems and whatnot. And of course, you, you need the gems, you know, as the, games, as the game goes through and you have alternate routes to take and things like that. Really, the, the whole purpose of a platformer is for it to be fun. You can have a good story if you want to, but it's not really necessary like with a JRPG or with like a Metal Gear game, like an espionage game. Um, I feel like that's where the story is really important. I feel like with a game like this, it's just a simple story. You know, he, Crash wants to save the world and rescue his girlfriend. I mean, it's just typical, simple stuff, you know. Not any big twists or anything like that, you know, necessarily. Uh, just typical platformer kind of behavior. But uh, I do like it still, nonetheless. And I think that the game, the first game, is it has pretty much a perfect length. It doesn't feel like it's too long, and it doesn't feel like it's too short. You know what I mean? It feels like it's solid. Like it feels like it's at a good length. It's not, again, not too long, not too short. You get your few hours out of it. Maybe, maybe what, four hours? I don't remember. It's been years. But maybe four to six hours of playing straight through to beat this game. I don't remember it being that long. But it was still satisfying and fun. And again, I got to play the sequels, man. Because I know, trust me, I know. I know how much they're beloved. So please... Feel free to share your memories of Crash Bandicoot in the comment section down below. Thank you for watching, and uh, we'll talk soon. Take care of yourself.